Our Father, who art in heaven. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into, into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Doing today? I said, how are we doing? Okay, good. Ah, great. So what you heard there is probably something that you've heard before. Um, even if you've not spent a lot of time in church or maybe even recited yourself or read yourself, that is what um, we would call the Lord's Prayer. And over the course of this series so far, Intentional Life, one of the things that we've attempted to do is talk about what it looks like as, as we step into a deeper relationship with Christ, the different attributes, the different things that God calls us to do. And for this kind of sub-series within, last week, Pastor Dave Ash, the youth pastor here, uh, spoke about, talked about uh, our engagement with Scripture and how Scripture is a way that the Holy Spirit speaks to us. We can change from that and understand instruction. Uh, this week, we're going to look at prayer. We're going to talk about this spiritual discipline, and by spiritual discipline, I mean opportunity to be able to connect, channel to, to open, to be able to connect with God and grow in that, in that engagement or through that engagement with Him. And so as we look at prayer, we're going to obviously walk through this one demonstration, this instruction that Jesus gives us, this, this method that He says, here is how you should pray. But I want us to also kind of see the broader understanding and, and a, gl a glimpse into this larger context of this connection between us and God. Now, I will, before I get going, I, I want to start with an illustration. Before I do so, I want to answer some questions and dispel some myths that some of you have, have already come up with. This past week, I was not here. And I appreciate all of you who said, hey, we missed you, whatever. But I, I, I also had a lot of people ask, how did the fishing go? And so, okay, some of you were here last week. So let me just say, I, I appreciate um, a congregation that allows some grace for me to be able to be gone. I, um, I got to go to my sister. She lives up in northern Michigan, and um, she, she's a homebody, and she loves uh, to see family, but doesn't get to do it all too often. So annually, she hosts a um, uh, kind of a family reunion at her house where anybody, uh, extended family, can come, and we enjoy some time together. And she lives right off of a river, the Sigmund River, and so fishing is obviously part of that. And in previous years, I have done quite well as we attempt to fish. And so I've got a picture of previous years, uh, I think. There it is. So, so this is, that is me. That's not Photoshopped. That's me. And that is a, uh, a coho salmon. So basically, what happens is the, the salmon will come out of Lake Michigan. They'll swim up the lakes, the, the streams, the tributaries, everything, back to the original place in which they were spawned, and then they will either lay eggs, fertilize the eggs, and then they will, they will pass away. And so at that point, this fish, I actually helped this fish because I, uh, you know, didn't, it didn't have to die a slow, grueling death. Instead, I caught it and then, um, and then ate it. And so, uh, <laughs> spoiler alert. Um, so, so basically, at this point, you know, we, we have a good time. We fish. Now, this year, this year, as many of you have asked, how did things go? I have not necessarily answered directly. Um, let me just get a list. Okay, so the river was too high. Uh, it was dark and cloudy. Uh, the water was too fast. I didn't hold my tongue right. This was the luck that we had this year. <laughs> and let me just say, that was one of the big ones. That was, uh, that was a keeper in our minds, so to speak, this year. So it, was, it literally was too high. A lot of the ports where we would typically walk into the water because we weighed in um, were, were, were closed, so we couldn't do that. So we fished offshore. I'm not even wearing waders there. And we caught a lot of these gobies, which are an invasive species. So we helped out the Department of, of uh, Natural Resources there in, uh, in Michigan by getting these invasive species out. So anyway, that is how my fishing trip went. Thank you for those of you who prayed for me. And... Uh, I, I would appreciate after we talk about prayer today, maybe a different type of prayer for the bigger fish. Again, just kidding, just kidding. But I remember back and actually driving up there, uh, we always kind of reflect or I reflect personally on, on previous years. And this is uh, kind of a fun trip that we take annually. I've missed it from time to time. Matter of fact, I missed the first two years. And so I came in a little bit late to the game, uh, the third year, which is maybe 12, 15 years ago. And I remember this, this, this first time that I went that I was kind of playing catch-up. 
Like I, I was playing, you know, th- this, this role of not typically understanding how things worked or what we were to do. I'd fished a lot before and I enjoyed it, but I'd never done wader fishing. I never walked into the water. And if you look at me, I don't have fins or gills. I, I'm meant to be on land. But we were doing this new thing where we were going where the fish were and walking into the water. I think there's a metaphor there also for us being fishers of men, um, which I do a better job of that than I do real fishing. But when, when, when we got there, this first time that it had ever gone, it appeared that everybody else knew what they were to do. And so that first evening we walked around and, and then we drove some places and looked for different entry points to fish. We found some places that we were going to go the next day, and so we, we go to bed, and we wake up the next day real, real early, and we, we go to breakfast, and we eat, and we talk about what our plans are, and then we, we go to the, 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 the tackle store and buy our licenses and some different things, lures that we would need, and then we get to the river, and we get to this park, and we, we get, out of, uh, you know, get out of the car, and we start putting waders on, and watching everybody else kind of doing what they're doing at that point, and I get my pole ready, and I get all the stuff I need, and I start to kind of just, with the crowd, walk with them. There's, you know, 10 or, or 12 people there, and we're walking down to the river, and we get to this place that's going to be our home base, where we put our boxes and our stuff there, and then we, we begin to walk into the water, and I remember this very vividly because it was my first time doing this, and I was a little bit scared, but I, I remember walking in because everybody else was doing it, and I thought, this is what you're supposed to do, and so I get in, and I'm about ankle deep, and I'm like, okay, you know, this isn't too bad, and then I'm, I'm knee deep at that point, and then I'm thigh deep, and then waist deep. Before, before I knew it, I was, I was out you know, 15 feet from shore, and the water was up around my waist, and at that point, I could feel like the little pebbles and the gravel like coming out from underneath my feet. I could feel the weight of the, of the water coming against me, and I'm starting to have to kind of turn my body. And at that point, I realized I wasn't literally in over my head yet, but I was in over my head on what I was doing because I had not really learned much about the process or what I was to expect. And within about 45 minutes, I found myself kind of just walking around, watching everybody else. I had yet to unhook my pole to even cast. I was just kind of seeing what they were doing. And I remember my uncle was off to one side, along the side of the bank where I was, and it was a little bit less, there was a little less current, so it was a little less turbulent there, but it was getting a little deeper. And I remember walking towards him and taking a step, and when I got to a certain point, I stepped down, which was, this is probably about six or eight inches, stepped down in the water, and as I did so, the water came up to about here, and my waders were here. And when I got to a certain point close to him, I started to slide. And as I did, he reached out and grabbed me, but it was too late. The water had already gone over and I was immediately freezing. And it's since I bought neoprene waders. So for those of you who want to, the rubber ones don't keep you warm at all. And from that point, I joined what we now call the Wet and Wild Club, which four-year member right here, just so you know, I've got four letters uh, in the Wet and Wild Club. But he grabbed me and pulled me out. And from that, I couldn't help but think I should have probably talked to you. Now, everybody else there had gone at least annually, or there was three or four guys that lived there. And they would go all the time. And I could have at any point asked them or talked to them or sought their wise counsel in this specific endeavor that I was about to step into. But instead, I literally just walked into the river and started the process trying to figure it out as I went. And I think what happens sometimes for us spiritually in our own lives is we might start the day or we go to work or we go to school or we start that meeting or have that conversation with our spouse without first seeking wise counsel from the wise counselor. And you might see where I'm going here, this idea of understanding that we have this real, I would say, blessing to engage with God the Father the wise counselor, the one that can see everything while we can only see what's right in front of us. You know, if you, got, you went to the parade yesterday, besides you may be freezing or getting a ton of candy, what you were able to see was just what was right in front of you. God has this other uh, bird's eye where he can see down from the start to the finish and everything in between. So we have this wise counselor and sometimes we step into life or we step into the river without first seeking Or we get into the river and we're moving around and we're getting deeper and deeper without stepping aside and saying, God, what do you have? How how do you want me to do this? Where do you want me to go? And so as we move forward today, I want us to look at specifically, we're going to look at one of uh, Christ's um, engagements with the people, one of Christ's engagements with those that are around him, and this understanding that he has actually given us a pattern by which to pray. 
And when we do so, it's not just some liturgical siding where we just say it and we move on, but instead it's supposed to be much deeper. In fact, it is much deeper. Prayer is where divinity meets humanity. Prayer is is this opportunity that we have to connect with the God of the universe. Get this, the God that created everything, that spoke it into existence, gives us, finite beings, the opportunity at any time, at any place to cry out, to call out, to speak with him. And he listens. No one else can can afford that same thing for us. No one else can give us the opportunity to give us undivided attention all the time. Prayer is is this opportunity to join God in what he is doing, to ask, to seek, to knock. Prayer is listening and learning. And, and And the awesome thing is God even gave us the avenue for which we can even come into his presence because prayer was only made possible because Jesus came to this earth and was the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice for us. We would not be able to address the Father because of his perfection and our imperfection if it was not for the sacrifice of Jesus. So not only does God allow us to speak with him, he gave us the avenue by which to do so. And this is available to all people. So some specific questions about prayer that we're going to kind of look at today is, or are, why should we pray? What does prayer actually do and how? should we pray? How should I pray? I think it was already up on the screen. Yep, it's there right now. The big thought for today is prayer is the miraculous communication process that allows us to talk to God. If you're following along in your note guide, this is the big thought for the day, and we're going to branch off from this as we look and walk through the scriptures today. But prayer is the miraculous. First and foremost, first and foremost it is miraculous. It is a miraculous thing. This is a miraculous thing where we can actually engage with the Almighty. Think about miracles. You know, I, I think sometimes we get in our mind that we read the Scripture and we're like, wow, in the New Testament church, there's these miracles that Jesus did or beyond, or we see miracles that happen in other countries even here today. Why aren't miracles happening here? Let me say right now, church, Every time somebody comes to the Lord, every time somebody gives their heart to Jesus and goes from a place of darkness to light, from death to life, that is a miracle. That is something we celebrate, that we get excited about. That is God working in a miraculous way, not something that science can prove, but a way where God says, I'm going to step in and I'm going I'm, I'm to do a miracle because we, and I've talked about this the last couple of weeks, us engaging in our world, and we are to do that. We are to be sent ones, but the real work happens by the Holy Spirit. We don't do that. We are faithful. We step forward. We, we are tools that God wants to use, but in all, in all honesty, the real power, the real transformation comes from the Holy Spirit, not from human hands. I think sometimes what happens in this form of prayer is the, 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 the miraculous communication process is we get in this place of communication being a one-way street, either one way or the other. Sometimes it's a place where we are the petitioner asking for God to kind of grant the things that we want. Or we never really ask, we just allow God maybe just to talk to us and we don't ever have any kind of response. Communication would indicate that there's this back and forth. God affords us opportunity. We see in Scripture, and especially in the Old Testament, where there's these engagements between the prophets, and they're they're talking to God, and there's this back and forth. And even in the New Testament with the apostles, and Jesus has this back and forth with God the Father. Prayer is the miraculous communication process that allows us to talk to God. Maybe you've been asked the question or played the game or even shared this question before, but if you could meet one person in history, one person in history, who would it be? And when I'm asked this question, sometimes I'll, I'll think of, you know, maybe a, a, a political figure, maybe a president from the United States in the past, or, or maybe, uh, you know, someone from the Revolutionary War time, or maybe I want to speak to, to somebody in Christian history, or, a, you know, a builder, a creator, or maybe even back in scriptural times, maybe a, an apostle. And sometimes I even hear people will say, Jesus. And I'm somewhat puzzled by that. Yes, I understand that you can't sit down at a coffee shop and talk to Jesus today, but you can. 
at any time, in any place, because of what he has done, we can have a conversation with Jesus here and now. And he listens and he answers. Prayer is real even here today. Today we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6. And if you've got your scripture with you today, you're, you're, you can, I, I would encourage you to follow along. Um, you can also look it up in, on uh, the, the Bible app, version. if you'd like to use that. It'll be on the screen too, for those of you who just like to look forward and stare uh, at the screen. That was a joke. All right, not that funny. But in this specific passage, we're in Partly, we're in what Jesus, uh, what he presided over, what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. And within the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is basically, this, this first portion actually of Matthew's gospel is talking about how to live as a disciple of Christ. How, how to live as a disciple, uh, not, not of this world, but an understanding of what it means and how to live like Jesus. And he's addressing different needs. He's addressing different things that they're going through. Matter of fact, he goes through these things called the Beatitudes, like how to live with an attitude, how to be, uh, how to have an attitude that, 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 is, that is honoring to God. And this specific passage we're going to look at today about prayer is actually on the heels of how to engage the needy. And this part, we see these two pieces actually go together where Jesus sees that what in that common day were known as the Pharisees, or they were religious leaders, but they were also political leaders and had their own interests at heart. They didn't really care as much about honoring God or building up the church, but they cared about building up themselves. And so at that point, Jesus sees this in the first portion of this this part of the the, the, uh, Sermon on the Mount. He's talking to them about how they need to give to the needy, but they don't need to point the finger back at themselves. It's not about, look what I did, but it's about, look who God is. And in so doing, you step forward selflessly serving others. And then he goes into this understanding of communicating the fact that when they pray, in many cases, they do so with the same flowery prayers that might make them look more holy, to kind of build their own resume or make themselves look great. And so Jesus not only corrects them and says, don't do this, but then the greatest act that he could commit in in this one instance is he gives a template, a method for engaging with God. And sadly, sometimes we see this specific passage and we think, okay, this is just something that we recite. You know, when I was in in Sunday school and I did something wrong, they make me say this over and over again. And somehow that gets like a negative connotation even, right? So it's like, and I I think I mentioned this first service, uh, but uh, it's not necessarily my notes, but I'm going to jump to it real quick. You know, you have like a child and and they they have vegetables on their plate and you tell them if you eat your vegetables, you can have dessert, right? What ends up happening is the vegetables become the negative connotation. The dessert becomes the treat that I want, and that same thing can happen sometimes when we look at Scripture, or even the Lord's Prayer. Oh, you recite the Lord's Prayer, it becomes the negative connotation. Oh, I can't stand this thing, but if I get you know, pardoned from whatever I did, then I'll have this dessert. No, the dessert is the Lord's Prayer. The dessert is the opportunity to engage with our Father. And Jesus has served that up for us. I don't know how many of you like to eat dessert first. If I don't eat it first, I won't eat it at all because I'll be full. But this is the place where Jesus says, eat the dessert first. And it's even nourishing. Maybe it was an apple pie. I don't know. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus is embraced by the the disciples coming to him and saying, hey, we want to know how to pray. And he says to them, this is how you pray. And so we see this in two different gospels, these two different angles. He's teaching the people and he's teaching his apostles, his followers, those that are closest to him. This is a universal method and understanding of who Jesus is and how he wants us to communicate with the Father. So we're going to read this together. If you've already turned there, great job. I'm getting there just now. You're ahead of the preacher. Good job. So the actions of those who choose to follow Christ look like this. Verse 5 says, And when you pray, Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into the room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And then Jesus flips to the other side in verse 9. It says, then this is how you should pray. 
Here's what not to do. Here's what it shouldn't look like. Here's what you should do. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And that is where the prayer stops in the scripture. However, many of you may also have this specific uh, addition of, of the doxology at the end about, about, about God and who he is. And we're going to look at that here today as well, because I think that there's something very uh, impactful for us to learn. But as we look at this prayer or this passage, there's two specific portions there. First, Jesus says, here's the framing of what prayer is. Here's what it isn't. Here's how you should do it. And then here's the practical method. First, he states what not to do, right? And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. And, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. What he's saying here is there's a specific template that you've seen from the spiritual leaders that are in your midst don't pray like that. Instead, I have created a new way, or I've given you a way, I've made it clear for you to see, and here's what you are to do. But before we move on to the actual prayer, let me just say, there's another thing that I think Jesus wants to do, and that is to read between the lines. There's an indication here that that Jesus has presented another message for us as believers, for those that want to be disciples, and it goes like this, and it's spelled out three different times, and when you pray... Do not be like the hypocrites. In verse 6, but when you pray, go into your room. In verse 7, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling. And when you pray, but when you pray, and when you pray. And the implication here is that what Christ is saying is it is a foregone conclusion. It is a prerequisite that if you are a follower, if you are a disciple, that you will be in connection with the Father. It's not an option. It's not something that you do when you feel like it or when you're down or when you're, you know, when you're, when things are are not going well in your life. No, you will pray because that is what engagement is. And the cool thing is the more you do it, the more you engage with God, the more that becomes your default mode. You pray with praises. You pray with expressions of, of, of asking God to lead you and guide you. You ask for, for wisdom. So why pray? Because communicating with God, connecting with God, is an integral part of being a disciple. Praying is an opportunity to, to step away from or, or, to be yield, or to yield from temptation. Prayer is a place of deliverance from oppression. Prayer is a place where we find healing, where we find victory. Prayer is a place where souls are one. Prayer is a place where we find wisdom and engagement with our Father. We pray to engage with God because Christ has already gave us the template that that is what we are to do as disciples. And the second part of it is he grants us an example of how to pray. And this is what we know of as the Lord's Prayer. And there's, there's been discussion over time in Christian history about whether this is just a liturgical prayer that we recite. And through that, I believe that when you do recite it with the right understanding, that there is this, this connection and this refreshing of the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, it's important to realize that the method is much deeper than just mere words. The method is much deeper than just saying the things that Jesus said, because that can become something where it's just a legalistic process that you just do because... I've always done it, or because that's what the church tells me to do, or because that's how I get out of trouble in junior church. I think I'm the only one that did that. So, But when we, when we read this, and we read the word, and we engage with it, Jesus not only eliminates the negative side, but presents the positive. And so if you're following along, we're going to read through this again. And I want to I take each piece, I want to look at this rhythmic petition giving and this understanding of praise and these sonnets and say, okay, there's the declaration, what, what was actually prayed, but there's also an implication for when we pray those things. The prayer once again goes like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So it starts, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the declaration here is this. This is a petition for God's kingdom and will. First and foremost, we praise God, hallowed be your name, but then we ask for his kingdom, his will to be the guiding light for our lives and our engagement in everything that we are. And the implication is surrender. The implication is surrendering to him, putting him on the pedestal where he belongs, or alleviating him uh, from, from any other expectation we have and saying, God, you are the God of all and I am not. And I think this kingship mentality or this kingship language can be difficult for us 2,000 years from removed from when this passage was written. Number one, because we live in a society where we have a say on who our leaders are. We get, we get an opportunity to vote for our, our leaders. We have an opportunity to vote for the president and for, for our local leaders and, and for our state government. We have, a, we have an opportunity to do that. And at the same time, we can give feedback on how we think things are going. But with a, with a kingship, with, 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 with this type of, of, of change, not a democracy, but a, but a kingdom, we realize and understand and we step into it that the king has all power, that the king is in control, that the king makes all the decisions. And so when we pray, your kingdom come, we are saying, okay, I am not going to try to be in control anymore. I'm not going to try to control my life, but I'm allowing you, the king, to be all powerful and sovereign in my life. God is all-powerful. He's over all things, but he grants us a little bit of power by giving us this this idea of free will. We have the choice to say yes or no. And when we relinquish that and say, God, I want you to be Lord of my life, we place him on the throne as the king where he rightfully belongs. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And this requires full surrender. Give us today our daily bread. A couple weeks ago, I talked about the Israelites and how they engaged with the, the, when they engaged with God and they were in the wilderness, that, that God provided manna for them, for their sustenance, to, to keep them going. And the fact that it only lasted for one day, aside from the, the Sabbath two-day collection, it only lasted for one day, it was this provision and understanding that on a daily basis, on a daily basis, God was providing for their needs. And the implication is this. The petition is for daily provision. The the implication is dependence. We must be dependent on God. Let me just say, in in my life, I I can't remember a time where I had to be dependent on God for my meal for the next day. We we live in a society where where that is is, is fewer or far between than it might have been in this time and and, and in the time, uh, uh, you know, and even in other countries right now. And so the concept can be quite foreign to us. While God does provide our needs, he provides our food and shelter and clothes and those things, there's 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 an underlying understanding here that God also provides strength for us, spiritual strength for us on a daily basis. And so this dependency is far greater than the physical things of this world, but it goes beyond to a spiritual realm and understanding. I know this goes against our fabric, but we must be dependent on God. You know, our culture teaches in every other area that at some point, you know, you, you have to be independent of your parents and you, you need to move on and get your own job, do all these different things. And, and that, that, is, that is great. I understand that. But when it comes to spiritual things, we never become independent of our spiritual father. The requirement, the understanding of being a disciple is that we never overpass the discipler. Moving on, and forgive us our debts. Declaration here is petition for forgiveness, and the implication is cleansing, being made new, being refreshed, allowing the spirit and, and, and the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus to, to rush over us and bring us a new and a fresh, this cleansing of, of bringing us to a new place. You know, we, at that point, we must admit we've done something wrong. 
When we talk about salvation, it's a point where, where we express, I can't do this on my own, and we realize it's not about, self-aware, or we, or about self-help or, or about trying to do it on our own, but we, we have this self-awareness and humility to say, God, I need you. I want you to be Lord and Savior of my life. This, this cleansing brings us to a new place where we, 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 we get uh, closer with God, but also we allow Him to give us a gift that we can't earn. I want to encourage you this week to to do an exercise that when you are cranky, when you're frustrated, when you say a mean word, when you shy away from what God might have for you, to pray these words and forgive us our debts or forgive me my debts and receive that forgiveness, that cleansing that God wants to grant to each of us. And then the other part of this is as we also have forgiven our debtors. As hard as it can be to receive a gift, it can be even more difficult to give it. And right here we see as we also forgive our debtors, the declaration is petition, this is a petition for forgiveness for those who trespass against you, against me. And let me just say this, as I read this word, and as I think about this concept, I take like a deep breath, like, because the whole thing is about release. Being released from the bitterness. Being released from the grudges, from the things that we hold against somebody. We live in a society where it is being offended first not giving anyone the benefit of the doubt, not giving them grace. We live in a society that would promote that you can hold stuff against people. Don't try to go and reconcile, figure out what they meant or what they didn't mean, but instead just hold it against them. And the bad thing about that is, the frustrating thing about that is in our society is that keeps us from what God has for us. It keeps us tied down to something that, first of all, the other person probably doesn't even know about. But also it brings us to a place where we are in in, in this bondage, this self-bondage that we have created and put on ourselves to keep us from going and stepping forward for where the Holy Spirit might want us to go. Let me just say, forgiveness for those who have trespassed against you is release. Don't let this hold you captive. Don't let the things that someone else might have done hold you captive. Don't be mad at people for always offending you, but get released from it. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The declaration here is petition for for protection from sin and evil, and the implication is deliverance. Deliverance. Deliverance from our our bondage, deliverance from our sin, deliverance from uh, this place of living in the darkness. Do do you know that when you live in the darkness, you are in a place where where this concept of spiritual warfare has you captive? I will will say this admittedly, and I've heard it from from many of you and and others, that we live in 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 a region where there is a dark cloud parked over top of us. This is, a, this is a region of, of, of real spiritual warfare. And when we read this part of the prayer and it says, but be delivered from the evil one, quite frankly, the evil one hates us. The evil one wants nothing more than to destroy your soul. And the reason for that is, the reality behind it is we were created in the image of a great and loving God. And because he hates God, he hates us. And so he is after our souls. He is after our relationships. He is after our marriages. He is after our children. He is after our our, our resources, our finances, our time. He is after all of it. And there's a spiritual warfare, a spiritual realm where there's a battle going on that we cannot see, but at the same time, it affects us really and rightly, not just here on earth, but also in eternity. So when we pray this and we say, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, and these are not mere words. This is an engagement in the spiritual realm where we say, God, please be at work. I beg you to deliver me. Don't allow me to fall into temptation, but allow your power to overcome the evil one in my life and the lives of the people around me and in this world. 
We acknowledge the spiritual warfare going on around us and the power of it. And we allow God, we invite God to be the champion on our behalf. And then finally, we get to this point in the prayer where we get away from, from Scripture, but the, the early church added this, 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 this doxology on the end to kind of bookend and frame the fact of who God is and what He's about. And it says, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And it ends with this, this doxology that points to who God is, Right? It points to the identity of who God is. It puts him on this pedestal and helps us to understand. And so as we kind of branch into that, this is kind of the the conclusion of, so how do we pray? We pray the same way that, that Christ had given us the pattern, and that is praise, petition in the will of God, and then once again praise. Understanding that humbly we are not God and he is. We place it in his hands. We ask for his guidance. We ask for his leading. And in all of those things, we say, God, we, we in every way possible submit this to you, knowing you are all-powerful. Praise, petition, and then praise. And so getting back to this specific beginning, it's hallowed be thy name, holiness, praise. And then in the middle, we see these petitions. But then we jump back. And when, when, we, when, when the scribes actually copied, let me just say this, when the scribes actually copied the scripture, When they got to the word Yahweh, what we read over as God or Lord in our English language, when they got to the word Yahweh, they literally before and after would have to take a ceremonial bath to cleanse themselves in a way to be able to be in the presence of the name of a holy God. How many times do we read over the word God or or Father or Lord in the scripture and when we do so, we just kind of read along like it's another word? If you followed along with me today, you did it. I did it too. But how powerful is it to say, hallowed be thy name, a name that is, that is so perfect, a, 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 a deity, a God that loves us so much that we can't even literally say his name because we're not clean enough to do so. It's easy to trust a king, let me say this, it's easy to trust a king when you know they are for you. Revelation 4, 8 says, heaven never stops praising. Isaiah 6 says, they are calling on one another and crying out for the glory of God. Thine is the kingdom. And we talked earlier about this king mentality. It can be difficult to surrender and say, here you go, God, take all control. But when we know that he is for us, when we know that he works to the good of all that love him, when we know that he is a great and gracious God, when we know that he can see the parade from beginning to end and everything in between, it is so much easier to say, God, I surrender to you. It's his kingship. The next part of that is thine is the power. He's not just a God of talk, but he's a God of power, a power that brings salvation for those who are lost. A power that says, I will step into your world. And 1 Corinthians 4, 20 says, For the kingdom of God is a matter, uh, not a matter of talk, but a, 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 but, excuse me, I'll back up. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. It's beyond just mere words. And then finally, thine is the glory. We get to be the recipients of the full glory of God through the person of Jesus. You know, in the Old Testament, they talk about wanting to see the glory of God, and God the Father says, you can't because I'm too powerful, I'm too bright. If you see me, you literally will die. And then in the New Testament, he brings this new covenant, and Jesus comes, and we get to see Jesus, the full glory of God, walk here on this earth. And when we do so, he shows us this pattern. John 1, 14 says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us We have seen the glory of God and we live. I'm going to ask the praise team to come back up. We're going to close here in just a moment with a song and then a a portion of time for reflection and prayer. But simply, there's a takeaway that I want to get, and that is this. True connection with God can only happen when you see and focus on Him. When we get to the root of that, what it means is this. What does a prayer do? Prayer is the posturing portion of us saying, okay, we're going to unleash God, and ultimately the unleashing changes us. Prayer changes the prayer. 
Prayer changes the vessel for which comes forward and praises God, asks petitions in his name, and then praises God once again because it changes who we are and what's happened in our lives. Prayer, praying like Jesus changes the prayer, the context of the world. You know, when you look at the early church, we see how they fervently prayed and how they reached out to God. And we see James, an apostle. We see him preaching the gospel only to be captured by Herod and put into jail. And then eventually, James is is killed. He's he's martyred for the gospel. He's martyred for the way, for, for, for the truth. And then along comes Peter, and Peter is captured, and he's also put into jail. And at that point, after they'd seen what happens, the church rallies around him, and together they meet, and they say, okay, we're going to have a prayer meeting, so to speak, and we're going to pray fervently that God would protect Peter and protect the way and protect his message. And after these prayers were offered up in the will and understanding of God, putting him on the, on the, on the, on the, on the pedestal, the understanding of, of who he was, the king of all, God sent an angel to that prison and opened the doors and broke the bondage. And Peter walked out of the prison and actually came and walked into the prayer meeting. And at that point, those that were praying and Peter alike saw the un- and understood the power of God through prayer. Let me just say today, church, I know that, that prayers aren't always answered the way that we want or in our timing, but I will say that God always answers prayer. And sometimes it's a yes, sometimes it's a no, and sometimes it's a not right now, but even in the context where it's not exactly what we want, he is still at work. And maybe that work is being done in you, the prayer, so that you might step forward in faith, so that you might be the vessel that he wants to use, so that you might be able to step forward and say, God, I don't know, I, I'm broken, I'm humble, I want to be, you know, whatever it is that you have for me, I want to step forward in that. I don't know where we come in today, but what I do know is that prayer works, and as the Spirit continues to lead and shows us when we place this method, not just words that we read, but this method of, of phrasing who God is, this method of, of posturing ourselves in humility, and this method of having proper and, and real engagement, uni, unified engagement with the body, that is where God truly works. So I'm going to ask you to stand. And as you do, we're going to go into a time of worship through song. But this time right now, as we sing together, as we sing about full surrender, May this not just be lyrics that we sing on the screen or, or something that we, we sing a, a nice melody because we like to hear it, but may this be our heart's cry here today. That we step into this method of understanding how Christ called us to pray and while we emulate that, we also demonstrate that in our life, in who we are and in how we live. So let us not only sing together, but let us pray at this point in reflection and love. Let's sing together. Yeah.